afternoon all. One of my favourite favourite players at the moment is Nakamura, who won the US Championship uh, just recently in 2012. Uh, I covered one of his wins with Black in the radio show, but unfortunately I had technical issues at the time and I couldn't put the radio show on YouTube. I'm going to try and make up for that again uh, with another game from that show I'll try and dedicate this video to. So against Alexander Stripunsky on the 16th of May of this year, uh, he was playing black, he faced e4, he chose the French defence, and actually after d4, d5, knight d2, uh, he chose the rather unusual knight c6, which is the Guimard variation. So with knight c6, black isn't using traditional knight f6, for example, to encourage uh, e5. In fact, black might be preparing a quick e5, as well as exerting, of course, immediate pressure on d4 here. Knight g f3, and now we see knight f6. After e5, knight d7, you might think, isn't this a bit silly? Because, you know, how do you undermine the pawn chain? Well, actually, an exploitable base of the pawn chain might actually be the head of it here, not the base here. f6, and with f6, say it takes, you can sometimes get f file pressure like that. But actually, curiously, f6 is not used uh, in a hurry at all in this game. In fact, after knight b3, Naka chose here uh, to play on that knight on b3 to play a5, which actually is not only preparing to gain space on the queen side, but also the rook is now able to do something with a6. And we'll see that forms an important point very soon because black ideally wants to get rid of these two bishops to weaken white's light squares. So a5 has a strategic significance. White reacted with a4 and from the moment Naka now played bishop e7. So he's ruling out any annoying uh, knight g5 or bishop g5. White played here actually instead of a natural looking say bishop d3 well, which might be a target now to actually knight b4. In any case, white played bishop b5. And here, curiously, we get an unusual looking move. We get knight a7. Now, okay, uh, I don't think white can take uh, this pawn. It looks as though just without engine checking this, c6 will attack uh, the knight and the bishop. So that's out of the question. So is this knight uh, actually encouraging the bishop to go back after knight a7? Uh, it does go back here with bishop d3. Okay, and we see b6, so this strategic idea is starting to be unveiled uh, that maybe bishop a6 is on the cards, but at the moment the knight's in the way. But black is also with b6 preparing c5, which would be ominously threatening a simple c4. Again, exploiting this awkward looking uh, knight on b3. So after bishop d2, white doesn't uh, castle just yet, he plays bishop d2. Uh, he's got other ideas here to perhaps discourage uh, c5, perhaps thinking that this pawn on a5 is a justification for the knight. It's called knight pressure on a5 here. But actually c5 is played in any case. Black doesn't have to, after d takes c5, which is played, Otherwise, you know, c4 looks very bad. Uh, it will be passive to do something uh, like a retreat. So white took here. Now Naka chooses knight takes c5. Okay, so he's conceded the d4 square, which might be a pain sometimes. But actually, you know, he is attacking the light square bishop. This bishop can go there after taking on d3. So white took on c5, allowing the very comfortable looking b takes c5 and here I would say black's opening has been success because actually uh, white hasn't even got that nice d4 square. This bishop could be good on the diagonal later. Uh, okay so it looks quite quite a good active position for black. b3, okay maybe trying to discourage c4. Black castled here and all this without f6 so it just shows there's no need the traditional f6. There's no need to try and bite on white's pawn chain, even at the head in this variation. So there's a new twist on the green mod. 
but it was all prompted by that knight b3 so far it seems that alteration of strategy uh, was justified so queen e2 and now knight c6 okay and now bishop b5 as though the bishop uh, okay it's occupying a weakened square in black's camp queen b6 white castled and now bishop a6 which looks logical uh, in general to exchange off the light square bishops c4 as though white will enjoy well long term pressure on the a pawn actually if he can take with the a pawn maybe even double up rooks on that a pawn bishop we justified anyway attacking a5 but no Necker leaves it there he puts his bishop on this diagonal now potentially bishop b7 and after rook ad1 knight b4 black looks absolutely fine in fact should we engine check this just for an engine evaluation looks as though black's pieces have no problems traditional light square bishop no problem in fact black is doing better than fine might have a microscopic advantage here which is an achievement with the black pieces uh, okay so let's see knight g5 and before the knight is allowed to coordinate with other things or even maybe f4 and then knight f3 the knight's kicked back to h3 at least and now d4 so extending the scope of this bishop access routes being built up to the white king but without f6 how is black going to open up the position knight f4 which actually marks out e6 you know it's like kind of one of the ideas of overprotecting e5 is often to discourage f6 but this is doing so without necessarily putting pressure on e behind d5 it's putting pressure on e6 directly and it's also of course implying knight h5 could be dangerous say bishop takes takes queen g4 that'd be mating with queen and knight so the king actually moves here to h7 now we see rook f e1 more traditional overprotection but also of course if the queen moves the rook might at some point swing in although that doesn't look like with this pawn here stopping the use of e3 and this other rook can't use d3 of course because of this knight here for the moment so how are these rooks going to help white attack can white's attack do anything or is black going to do something rook g8 and now after knight d3 we have uh, an aesthetically interesting position with rook a f8 the, the rooks are cuddling cuddling the king here next to each other as though maybe f6 will be useful one day we get this knight exchange now and a check g6 okay bishop f4 so white has that iron grip on e5 here what about this bishop though it's staring at e8 and okay white might have a5 on the cards at some point king g7 which uh, means actually if queen d2 maybe you know rook h8 is possible or even g5 though if, if the h6 pawn really needs to be uh, defended somehow in fact after queen h3 g5 now even though you might think though that uh, well if you provide g5 it's an undermineable target in its own right but here you know after bishop g3 uh, there's a white king here so maybe you know an f4 move is not desirable in this particular kind of position king h7 queen g4 now rook g6 as though maybe you know in the future f5 supporting e6 here laterally h3 now king g7 queen h5 some maneuvers here rook g8 rook d3 maneuvering queen a7 where is the queen heading in fact after f3 now committal pawn move bishop d8 this shuffling of the bishop here and this queen could go behind it to perform a useful battery on e5 king f2 king f8 though interestingly so why king f8 and what is the king doing it seems both kings in the last two moves are keen to march over to the queen side king e2 the king's making a run for it on the queen side bishop c7 king d1 is the king actually safer there well black 
has no strategic breaks on this side of the board. How can he open lines to the king if it lives over here now? Queen a8. Eyeing f3, but for the moment adequately defended by everything. Um, okay, so king c1. And now a radical move, f5, making use of that pin on the bishop, gaining space, and making this bishop look a bit less comfortable. It's got less squares now after this space gain by black. And the black king joins in with the white king in migrating to the right hand side of the board from black's perspective here to the queen side. What are the kings doing in this game? Quite a fascinating maneuvering game, really, with black. Rook d2 and now f4 really shutting down that bishop and also indicating of course g3 looks totally unplayable with this battery. Bishop g1 eyeing d4 and is it pointlessly eyeing d4? Well there might be a sacrifice later on in the game. Queen f8 and indeed here it looks as though black is going to play queen f5 really making this bishop look irrelevant to what's going on on the light squares. If the queen comes here across these light squares it looks as though white's position is in a bad state. If the queen can't be evicted and bishop takes e5 is on the cards. Say, say white also plays queen g4 queen f5 and takes. You know there'll be frontal pressure on this pawn potentially with rook e6. This pawn looks as though it's in big trouble actually because this bishop can't help that pawn. So maybe recognizing the position is somewhat on on the way downhill here of the queen f8. White sacrifices a whole bishop. Very dramatic. Alexander plays bishop takes d4. It's taken and after rook takes d4. Okay, immediate threat to rook d7 check. Let's get the material back. Bishop c8 looks as though it's defending d7. What's the problem? c5 now, and it looks as though actually c5 makes use of e5 as well for rook d6, which will provide a pawn dangerously uh, on the sixth row. And also, maybe if taken this way, a frontal attack on e6 might be on the cards later. Okay, for the moment, though, no. okay. Naka ignores that potential for rook d6. He plays queen g7. So one question, why is he rejected actually queen f5 here? If he wanted to attack e5, why go to g7 to attack e5? That's an interesting question really. Should we just engine check this position? It seems black is technically better with queen g7 one of the stronger moves. Queen f5, does that fall into anything? Of course, bishop d3. Bishop d3 is possible to evict the queen. Advantage to white, pardon me. <laughs> so yeah, if he if Naka wants to attack e5, it has to be now with queen g7. Okay, which he uses. Queen g7. So this c5, yes, giving the bishop options to come back, not just e6 but across the diagonal. And in fact here, okay, he doesn't use that yet, uh, bishop d3, because there might actually be bishop takes e5 counter-attacking this rook. He, he gets that rook out of the way tactically with rook d6. Exchange sack. So it's very dynamically played by white so far, but with his queen kind of locked out over here on h5, can he really justify all of this. He's technically now after bishop takes, c takes. He's a rook down. Okay, but for how many pawns? For like two pawns. Seven pawns for white. Five for black. Two pawns for rook. But he's going to win the exchange now by force after this check with his next move, bishop d3. So winning the exchange will mean actually now he's basically a bishop up and he doesn't mind taking. Uh, his exchange with the queen first, it doesn't matter, it's going to end up boiling the position down further anyway. The queen's coming off, whatever happens. So, okay, rook d1, bishop, okay, for two pawns. Is it really just the technique job here of the bishop d5? 
which looks as though you know these the two pawns are a bit vulnerable. Rook d4. Okay. Now Naka doesn't actually want to play bishop takes b3, I think, because a rook takes b4 and check. Is this actually a big issue here? His move chosen is king d7. Let's see why. This engine check bishop takes b3 here. White's black's advantage rather looks to be okay, still there. Maybe it's not so bad. It's not so bad. Uh, Necker chooses instead though king d7. So he's offering up b4. Three pawns of the bishop for the moment. Rook g8 is getting his rook involved. Perhaps rook f8 though. As though now actually the immediate threat is rook f5. Get this pawn to be able to get this one. And he doesn't mind that a5. It looks kind of scary maybe to some of us. h5. But actually now he plays h5. So another idea not just to win this pawn the idea of the rook but actually just supporting this pawn which means now g4 try and get this g2 and get this pawn down the board that's the basic plan but after rook b6 a change of plan here after rook b6 because now there's a threat potentially of rook a6 to a7 which could be annoying rook a8 is played prompting protection of this pawn b4 now g4 getting on with it here because the rook, there's nothing attacking f4 at the moment in any case. So um, the rook doesn't have to be on f8 at the moment. It's holding guard here on the queen side. Takes, takes, takes. Okay, bishop takes g2, and a pass pawn here has emerged. a6, bishop d5. Very exciting position now. So has white got enough for the piece? Has his pawns got enough inertia? Rook b5, f3, king e3, rook f8, threatening f2, king f2, stopping f2, rook h8, threatening rook h2. Okay, and here, again, white must have thought his position is in dire straits and plays again dynamically, but. Um, Again, there's another big question. Is there enough compensation? He goes an entire rook down now by playing the exchange shack again. So instead of a bishop down, there's a rook down again after this. Now b5, but we have this kind of armada of pawns to deal with. So again, a dramatic game from that guy. He's involved in many dramatic games in this US Championship. Fascinating. And he plays a move which, okay, I was covering on, on with, with live commentary on... Um, play chess over rook b8 and I thought uh, for a minute or two actually maybe more than that that a7 looks strong here but um, in fact Naka does seem to have resources here say rook a8 b6 say king c6 it looks as though um, this this is uh, winning actually uh, for 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 black because say here takes here 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 king d6 to the rescue it seems the pawns never have enough inertia the king's always going to get to them so this rook sack doesn't seem entirely sound after this rook b8 was in fact rook b8 was there an actual need for precision here let's just check this it seems rook b8 was one of the most powerful moves in the position going plus three so if Necker had actually played let's say something else would he be in trouble if he had played rook a8 g5 equal so rook b8 was actually the most testing move it seems d4 takes King e6. This armada of pawns actually means something here in this variation. d7, g6, king e4, and okay, with this pawn over here, this, this is trouble, isn't it? Looks zero, zero, zero engine is crying out. But after this very, very super accurate move, 
which did cause me a lot of confusion when I was covering this the other night on the play chess server. It seems A7 is, is busted. Now let's just run the engine check on A7 here, or other things. A7, second move, okay. Rook A8, let's say B6, King C6 as we said. And the pawns are crumbling, aren't they? Let's say G5 takes, that. that's as we said before, that in this position, the king coming to d6 is a fantastic blockader. The pawns are, are being wiped off the board here. Hmm. Okay, so unfortunately, it seems that really spells out White's doom here for White. Uh, Alexander must have been gutted by these variations the more he looked at them. He played g5. His pawns are all being knocked out now. His poor armada he'd sacrificed an entire rook for is being knocked out. Rook the eight, a7, rook a8. g7, still looks a little bit dangerous for a moment, but uh, now it's becoming abundantly clear that the pawns are just falling like ripe apples, unfortunately. So here, actually, in this position, I'm sure by now that there must be more than one way of winning this position. King c6 holds on to black's d pawn. If the king ventures, let me just push this pawn. So here actually white uh, resigns in this position. With the rook committed to that pawn, let's have a quick final check on this position. So if the king ventured in, just d4, and there's no time well, in fact, King F7, you just take it and take here. You, you can just mop up here to sack and queen your pawn. So that's that's hopeless. Okay, the poor armada of pawns uh, was just one accurate move here. It's incredible in this ending scenario. Rook B8 just knocks out all of White's potential for these pawns. So that's that's a nice um, end game uh, move. Right. Positively encouraging a7. The king is really, if we look at this again in slow motion here, the king is really first gripping the light squares here for blockading here. Then, after taking there, it's coming back on dark squares, aesthetically, locking here. And the rook, of course, is, is the back row defender. Let's have a look at this game again. A French defense queen mod. Not a surprise weapon one can use against the Tarash variation. So knight c6, but no rush to play for f6 onto knight b3. Just play on the knight b3. A plan in its own right now for black. Knight a7, nifty looking move. Prepare c5. And already black looks as though he was doing very well. In fact, I think this knight b3 thing, it looks like a dangerous, dangerous weapon in one of Watson's books, which I might have used unsuccessfully myself. The knight can be awkward on b3 and help fulfill strategic goals for black in the French defence. Notably, this bishop didn't seem to have too many problems, like in uh, some French defence games where it can be a nightmare. And so, in fact, it was white's bishops that seemed to get. Uh, uh, very bad prospects uh, soon. So it seems part of Naka's plan here was actually to restrict, in retrospect, this bishop continually. And that bishop was squeezed soon. So Naka was getting his king into safety to repair that pin. It seems once white played f3, the bishop was loose, as we see soon. See, so he's played f3, the bishop's now loose. So he's arranging a pin on this pawn in order to play f5, f4. So this pin arrangement is being devised. And here, he didn't play f5 in this situation. Instead, maybe um, it carried some danger here to play f5 immediately. It looks, looks too weakening, maybe for e6. Actually, actually. Let's just check that. F5 here takes takes 
Queen G4. Hang on here. This is this is getting hairy, isn't it? White's got a big advantage, for example, here apparently. It's hairy. The king's not maybe at all safe here. So the f5 was was prepared in his own time. Of the queen a8, king z1. Now f5. So subtle difference in this position, perhaps. Uh, if we look at that now, what we just saw. Uh, why is it radically different here? Takes, takes queen g4 as we saw earlier. Oh, the king is not protecting e. Okay, so let's have that rook. Queen e6, and then there's queen d8 to the rescue of e7 as well. So two major things changing there. So this this queen move so so queen d8 is very useful defensively if white did sacrifice that bishop so it's all cunning stuff the more we look at this and unravel the game like a peeling onion the onion layer is coming off so f5 was actually working now tactically uh, even if white wanted to sack that bishop uh, in dynamic fashion mind you with the rook yeah it's it's really off the cards now this taking on f6 um, so the bishops going to be squeezed positioning so black built up more positional advantage and kind of induced this first first piece sacrifice otherwise white's going to be really helpless for this e pawn soon it's kind of dislocated by these guys that this pawn's in enemy territory and about to be swallowed whole so inducing a peace sack then an exchange sack for white to be a rook down then winning bet the exchange to be a bishop down but now the pawn armada uh, was counterbalanced by whites. Just one one pass pawn of major significance, the f pawn, encouraging black to sacrifice the exchange again to be a rook down. But this armada knocked out move of the game, perhaps rook b8. That's the end of white's pawn inertia here. Okay, and the rest of the game is. Uh, not too uh, uh, difficult for black. Okay, um, hope you enjoyed it. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.